I was pleasantly surprised when I was asked to give this talk and preparing for it has taken me all the way back to my early days as, a, as an assistant professor at BYU when we were just starting to work on capillary supercritical fluid chromatography. In 1979, a graduate student of mine, Paul Peden, and I spent the summer at Indiana University to begin work on capillary SFC with Milos Novotny, my PhD advisor, and one of his graduate students, Stephen Springston. We quickly learned that we needed to do some work to figure out how to immobilize the stationary phase on the column wall so that it would not be extracted by the solvating power of the supercritical mobile phase. Paul figured that out when we returned to BYU, and with John Felstead, we put together an SFC instrument, did some separations, and published a paper in 1981. This slide shows a photograph of the supercritical fluid chromatographic system that we put together from a Varian 8500 syringe pump, a Hewlett Packard GC oven, and a Perkin Elmer fluorescence detector. And on the right, the first respectable chromatogram that we obtained. Looking back, it probably wasn't the safest experiment using n-pentane as mobile phase at 32 atmospheres in a 210 degree oven. However, we were very careful about leaks and the mobile phase flow was really quite low. With the system, we were able to chromatograph polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons from two to seven rings at a relatively low temperature. Notice that the column was a 58 meter long column, fairly long column, and 0.2 millimeter ID, also a fairly large diameter. Phenyl methyl polysiloxane was a stationary phase, and it was cross-linked, which I'll talk about that as well later. The stationary phase that we used in this first study was a methyl phenyl polysiloxane that we heavily cross-linked with a peroxide free radical initiator. At the same time, unknown to us, two other groups in Switzerland and Belgium were working on the same thing but for high temperature gas chromatography. All three groups published papers within one year of each other. This has become the basis of immobilization of GC stationary phases today. An advantage of using an open tubular column in supercritical fluid chromatography is that the pressure along the whole column can be maintained above the critical pressure and with a very low pressure drop using a simple restrictor at the end of the column. The first restrictor that we used was a linear restrictor shown at the top that consisted of a small diameter capillary tube connected to the at the end of the column. Eventually, a silica monolithic plug at the end of the column became the restrictor of choice, which was developed by Hernan Cortez and Bruce Richter at Dow Chemical Company. This slide shows a number of other designs of restrictors that were reported over the years. Years ago, it was very unpopular for a university faculty member to be involved in commercial activities. Prior to the 1980s, only a few academicians had become involved in such kind of activities. In an article published by Analytical Chemistry in 1985, a statement by Peter Kissinger, who at the time was a Purdue faculty member and an early chromatography entrepreneur, had this to say, quote, there has been a 180 degree change in the attitude toward business formation in academia. It used to be associated with going to the devil. Now it's perceived almost as a heroic sort of involvement. This statement was pretty accurate at the time. I was fortunate that Brigham Young University was early in recognizing the value of patenting and licensing intellectual property developed by faculty members. In fact, BYU is consistently recognized as the top university in the United States for the number of invention disclosures, the number of patents filed, and the number of licenses granted per million dollars of research funding received. 
This was a perfect environment for me to orchestrate the start of a small business called Lee Scientific to commercialize a capillary SFC instrument. The first capillary SFC instrument that Lee Scientific produced was the Series 501. This instrument had a newly developed syringe pump but used a Hewlett Packard 5890 gas chromatographic oven and flame ionization detector. You can see in the upper right the pumping system with its outer shell removed and easily visible is the syringe pump. This was based on a similar design as the Varian 8500 syringe pump. This system was introduced at Pitcon in 1986 and the first instrument was shipped to shell development later that month. At the same time, several other capillary SFC instruments appeared on the market, including one from Chemical Data Systems, one from Suprex, and a pumping system from Bob Brownlee at Brownlee Labs. In 1987, Lee Scientific completed the development of a new oven equipped with a flame ionization detector and high-pressure valve injector. And the whole system was called the Lee Scientific 600 series. The uh, instrument was controlled with a computer. Notice the up-to-date modern floppy disk drive. Under the leadership of Brian Jones, Lee Scientific introduced a line of SFC capillary columns containing a number of free radical cross-link stationary phases under the trade name Superbond. Some of these phases were very unique at the time, including the N-octal, biphenyl, and smectic liquid crystal functional groups. Capillary SFC was then, and is still today, the best technique to use for analyzing non-volatile thermally labile compounds that don't have a UV absorbing chromophore, or to use the FID for quantitative analysis when you're using neat CO2 as a mobile phase. Also, with carbon dioxide as a mobile phase, one can use the popular electron capture detector, nitrogen phosphorus detector, and sulfur chemiluminescence detector that are used in, uh, widely in gas chromatography. I think most would agree today that anything that can be separated by normal phase chromatography can be separated faster by supercritical fluid chromatography. Capillary SFC is also very easy to couple with mass spectrometry. Now to look at a few applications. This separation by Tom Chester and David Ennis at Procter & Gamble shows a nice separation of corn syrup solids up to a molecular weight just under 7,000. The flame ionization detector was used here and carbon dioxide was used as the mobile phase. Tinactin is a treatment for athlete's foot with the active ingredient tolnaftate. With an FAD, it's easy to see the active ingredient along with the distribution of white petroleum carrier hydrocarbons. This is impossible to do using a UV absorption detector. Typical GC separations of normal hydrocarbons stop around C50. Here's an SFC separation of a Fisher Tropes wax reported by Steve Hawthorne and David Miller at the University of North Dakota which extended up to carbon number 100 and this was obtained using a temperature of only 125 degrees C. Notice that a 10 meter long column 50 micron ID was used for doing this separation which is a typical dimension for column 4 capillary SFC. For comparison, here's a gas chromatogram obtained by a Dutch group under the supervision of uh, Hans Gerd Janssen, for which a, the temperature program went up to 430 degrees C. Obviously, a GC column will not last long taking it up to that kind of temperature. 
A nice separation of sulfur heterocycles extracted from a coal liquid was obtained using a sulfur selective chemiluminescence detector. This detector works well at the low capillary SFC carbon dioxide flow rates. A highly polarizable biphenyl polysiloxane stationary phase was used for this separation. Notice that a 10 meter long 50 micron ID capillary column was used at a temperature of 100 degrees C. Also, notice at the bottom of the chromatograms that these chromatograms were obtained by pro programming the density from about 0.2 grams per milliliter up to 0.6 grams per milliliter. The smectic liquid crystal polysiloxane stationary phase is used for the separation according to shape of, mole of the molecules. This slide shows a comparison of the separation of 11 seven ring polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons on this smectic liquid crystal stationary phase compared to a separation on a polymethylsiloxane stationary phase under the same conditions. Notice that a 10 meter long 50 micron ID capillary column was used in both cases and a density program from 0.3 to 0.7 grams per milliliter at 0.007 grams per milliliter per minute was used. The separations were obtained at 120 degrees C, again with carbon dioxide in the flame ionization detector. On the polymethylsiloxane stationary phase, very little separation was obtained, which is uh, expected because these compounds have very similar structures and very similar polarities and vapor pressures. On the other hand, you can see on the left the separation with the liquid crystal stationary phase according to size gives a wide separation of these compounds over about 40 minutes. An interesting application using capillary SFC was a study that we conducted for the Defense Department at Dugway Proving Grounds which is located in the Utah West Desert. The least expensive way to dispose of aged munitions is to detonate them in the open air. But there was a concern about possible hazardous combustion byproducts being carried downwind where people lived. Because many explosives and their byproducts are unstable under GC conditions, we were asked to use SFC. I'm not allowed to give much information about the results, however, I can explain how the experiments were done. In the lower left, you can see a detonation mushroom cloud plume. On the lower right is a fixed wing aircraft with a sampling probe extending out over the cockpit. After the plume starts to diffuse, seen in the center larger picture, the aircraft, which is waiting in the air for the right conditions, flows through the dissipating plume. You can see the aircraft on the left side of the plume. It could pass back and forth through the plume three times before it became too, diff too diffuse. And it took three seconds each time. So a total of nine seconds. After the plane landed, we received the samples to analyze by capillary SFC. The table on this slide shows the variables of each of the three chromatographic techniques that can be varied to affect selectivity. Gas chromatography is affected by temperature and stationary phase type. LC is affected by temperature, stationary phase, and mobile phase, while SFC also adds mobile phase density as a variable. The chromatogram on the right shows a separation of oligomers under simultaneous density and temperature programming. The density is programmed from about 2 grams per milliliter up to 0.5 grams per milliliter, while the temperature is programmed from 100 degrees C up to 160 degrees C. A 10 meter long 50 micron ID capillary coated with polymethyl siloxane was used as the stationary phase and carbon dioxide was used as a mobile phase. 
Looking at a phase diagram of carbon dioxide, the solid, liquid, and gas phases of matter are partitioned around the triple point. The phase boundary where both gas and liquid phases coexist, as can be observed in a high pressure container with a sight window, extends up to the critical point. Anywhere above and to the right of the critical point is considered a supercritical fluid although there are no boundaries between the supercritical region and the two subcritical regions. The upper subcritical region is more liquid-like, while the lower one is more gas-like. Of the two subcritical regions, I believe packed column chromatography is better suited for the upper, more dense subcritical region, where capillary SFC is better suited for the lower, less dense super subcritical region. The conditions that are often used for SFC are actually in the subcritical regions. From what was described in the last slide, it is obvious that the boundaries between the chromatographic techniques are becoming blurred, with the two subcritical regions split on either side of SFC, one toward higher diffusivity and lower viscosity, and the other toward greater density and better solvating power. Also from the GC end of the spectrum, you have solvating gas chromatography, while at the LC end of the spectrum, you have enhanced fluidity LC and high temperature LC. Over 50 years ago, Cal Giddings alluded to this blurring of chromatographic techniques. Quote, While the similarities of gas and liquid chromatography are much more prominent than the differences, they can be stated much more succinctly. Zone migration and separation occur by virtue of the same kinds of thermodynamic flow, kinetic, and diffusion processes, and are thus subject to the same theoretical laws. The differences between gas and liquid chromatography are naturally centered around the differences in gases and liquids. As far as chromatography is concerned, the most significant differences are related to some of the physical properties and their immense variation from liquids to gases." Close quote. An interesting experiment that we did in 1991 was to coil a 50 micron ID capillary column into a 0.25 centimeter coil to induce supercritical fluid secondary flow in the capillary. The high velocity led to a lot of noise. However, it was clear that much better resolution was achieved with the tightly coiled column. Further miniaturization of chromatographic techniques may lead to some interesting behavior that can be put to great advantage. So what is the future of SFC? The following list shows the current situation in black and some future possibilities in red. Today, SFC predominantly uses pack columns similar to liquid chromatography. I believe there's a bright future for SFC with miniaturized column configurations, clever enhanced fluidity approaches along the lines of Susan Olesic's work, and more use of the various programming modes that are available. There is also a growing trend to more green analytical methods. Again, from Cal Giddings, I quote, the basis of chromatography is a kaleidoscopic blend of interrupted geometry, ubiquitous diffusion, and erratic flow. The practical tasks required of it are equally varied and complicated. The collection of unique rules to cover the nearly unlimited diversity of chromatography will be out of reach for a long time to come. This quote was in his book, Dynamics of Chromatography, written in 1965. And finally, I think we would all agree that Jim Waters provided powerful advanced tools for chemical analysis that have had a tremendous impact on humanity, and these will be felt for many years to come. Thank you very much.